Uh, indentured servants are quite slaves. It's a very, very controversial and divisive subject in some areas, particularly uh, in the United States. And there have been uh, some eminent people like John Brennan, as he said, nearly got his head chopped off when he mentioned white slaves at one stage. So, what I do in my talk uh, tonight, I'll cover some. Uh, I suppose views on the whole issue of white slaves, some on the in, indentured servants, and I suppose I have my own particular view, and let you, I give you a few hints on some books that are maybe well worth reading, and uh, to confirm your own opinion. Okay? And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Why did I pick this kind of subject? Um, I'm, as Eddie said, I come from Passage West, and back in right in the 1600s, there were records of shipping uh, and slaves being sent out from Passage West. You had also indentured servants being sent out from Passage West, and even up into the 1800s. And of course, Captain Roberts. Uh, the skipper of the uh, series first ship uh, off the Atlantic came from Passage, but he came to fame when he was only a midshipman and he was in charge of a boat called the Black Joe and uh, captured a slave ship coming up from Africa. And he became famous for that and it helped in his career. But also, he, it held him back in his career because at that time, um, it wasn't, it, slavery was a very profitable business to a lot of the merchants in parts of England. So there was a bit of a cliff stick there. Indentured servants, and most of you would know the modern version of apprenticeship. Uh, Down on museum and the document dated 18. 75, a young fellow served his apprenticeship in the dock. Uh, the, doc, the document itself was a legal document and they were actually printed by guides in car and it left spaces for the different businessmen who was employing the apprentice to put in their own rules. And I just read some of the the ones that were uh, on it, some unique ones like that, for the period of apprenticeship, they could not play at cards or dice tables, frequent playhouses, ale houses, or taverns. And this was all a legal document. And then there was the one, also in the same document, they shall not commit fornication not contract matrimony during the term of the document. All I say, you'd like to pick that up and hand it to an 18-year-old today. <laughs> um, but, so that is, there's a history, particularly around the apprenticeship era, of the indenture. And it was a legal document because I've seen reports where employers had a nag on to say, uh, looking for, give no reward for a runaway <coughs> apprentice. And I have seen that in the records of the young fellows joined the strike and they were brought to court, but uh, through leniency they were left off in court. So it's very much illegal. So that will give you a picture of what endangered servants were. And this was practiced. Well, up into the 1950s, I'd say you had an apprenticeship. I start with, I suppose, this one, the Stolen Village. Uh, in the, we had a case of piracy in Baltimore, the sack of Baltimore, was it Tom Stavis? Tom Stavis, was it wrote the poem? Yeah, was it? 
back in Baltimore for the Saints and Wars, and there was a Dutch captain uh, who contacted a, a chap that knew John Hackett in York, and the original target was King Sale, but the thought was too well protected, and Hackett decided to bring him to um, a safer port, so but it wouldn't be much uh, military like in Kinsale and so they got into Baltimore Harbour and they launched their attack on a sleeping village before dawn of the next morning. The inhabitants were taken completely by surprise and more than 200 armed corsairs landed in Baltimore Cove. They set for all the buildings which and the main had tax roofs and they carried off with them young and old out of their beds. And they went down and took more uh, around the, the wider village and by the time more than a hundred men, women and children had been taken. And remember these would have been boats that had been rowed by the tribes, always from the likes of Algiers, the North Africa, down in different ports and that, so they had a, a long journey and they brought them away to the slave markets in North Africa. The poem, which I think uh, yeah, so I put in just a little verse, and it, I think it captures the uh, time honestly within each roof along the rocky street there must be lover friends with gentle gliding feet stiff gas dreaming eyes the roof is in the flame from out their beds and doors the rush made sir and dame and mess upon the threshold stone the gleaming sabers fall for each black and burdened face the white or crimson shawl the yellow pallor breaks above the prayer, the shriek and roar of oh, blessed God, the Algerine is Lord of Baltimore. So that's a famous long poem by Thomas Davis, the sack of Baltimore. But at that time, they, they, they had, I talked of like a football team, where they, they were called the Sandy Rovers. But uh, they came, uh, from North Africa and had a very thriving trade and Ireland so of course was uh, a fairly soft target at that stage. So they were brought back to the uh, to be sold in slave markets there. Now a more recent time uh, so thanks how many have read this book? It was to me, it was a fascinating book, well written by a man. He was in the UN London for many years, he was ex army officer and with the UN, UN. And we've all had, heard of to head up to Canuck, but the people are at the end, it started around 1652. Uh, some of those who fought against Cromwell were given the option of leaving the country and going to join with a other armed force. The others who would move to Connacht are if were powerful enough that uh, their land was taken from them forcibly and this uh, cut across not only from say the Irish uh, Catholic side, but it went right across the uh, union supporters as well. If they landed, they just didn't go to Connacht. Many were sent off to um, <coughs> off to, to, to slavery. Barbados, or <coughs> am I hopping around too much, brother? Uh, okay. But, uh, uh, that uh, the majority there, so 
swordsman as James Scotland had gone abroad to join the armies uh, in France and Spain, but they weren't allowed to take their families with them. So you had a lot of families, many just thrown off their land because they couldn't keep or, or keep or till the land. So they were, in, in a sense, the easy prey as well. And they, they were destitute, so they couldn't pay, pay their way. And they were rounded up, very much like cattle. Uh, the men, there were men catchers that, as they were called, were mounted and armed with long whips. And they held the, her, these unfortunate people at, shall we say, around the, those who left on the so Cork area, Passage, Kinsale, Yall, and that would have been collected in the main from Tipperary, uh, North Munster area down, and they were marched down, very, driven very much like cattle down to the departure the ports. They were branded with the initials of the ship that would take them to Barbados or Virginia. And this is where the dilemma starts for a lot of people. Uh, Virginia needed a lot of workers for to keep the tobacco plantations going, as Barbados needed them for the sugar plantation, just as many went to Virginia. They were attached together with ropes around their legs and marched to uh, the ports. Waterford, Cork, Dungarvan, Passage, Yall, Kinsale, Bantry. And some were also put onto uh, prison hulks uh, to wait their ships coming from Bristol or London. In September, a captain, a captain John Berman was employed by the Commissioner for Ireland and signed a contract on behalf of uh, Mr. Selick and Mr. Yeoman, two Bristol merchants. And the contract was to supply 250 women above the age of 12 to be found in the country within a 20 mile radius of Cork, Yard, Waterford and Wexford and then transported to Barbados or New England. Lord Brothel, who was then Governor of Cork, assured the commissioners that he could find the 250 within a short time within the environs of Cork alone. So that was a contract to ship out uh, young uh, women of uh, marriageable age and not past breeding. They were eagerly sought by the sugar planters who were to court Henry Cromwell, had only the negresses and maroon women to solace them. <laughs> uh, you know, you can only imagine the plight of these poor women shipped off to very, very foreign land. The men catchers were paid four pounds, which was for every young woman of child. There's reference that a number of children involved in the you know, two gardens. To, so John Clapper would give them a license by the Board of Trade to transfer 1,000 children to Virginia. The conditions of the young maidens of noble families were despoiled of their possessions, dragged almost naked and piercing heaven with shrieks to ship bound for the West Indies. That was a statement by 
uh, Cardinal Rinuccini, who was the papal nuncio at the time to the Confederation of Kilkenny and very outspoken about the whole issue of slavery at that time and forced transportation. And give you some idea of what happened, no different to what happened to poor and Protestant slaves from Africa. When they arrived in Bridgetown, Barbados, officers went to board and officials on the plantation went to board to assess the cargo. The slaves were allowed four days in which to recover from rigors of the voyage. They were given fresh food, uh, food and also a time to walk around the decks because before this, for weeks and then, they were stuck in the bottom of the uh, very bad, bottom of the ships. They were manacled together, but the leg arms were, remained in place. The men were given pipes and tobacco and three tops of rum each day. So then, after that, they were taken to <coughs> their hose down to make a bit look respectable. And uh, slaves were divided into four categories, women and girls, men and boys, the children of both sexes, and lastly, the refuse, those who were unfit for much labor or were too old or sick. And it happened through the boys. The refuse was sold off first at the cheap, cheapest price possible. There's a big uh, difference in estimates of how many men, women and children from Ireland were exported uh, to West Indies or Americas. The number varies from 12,000 by uh, Nora Foster who wrote in Modern Ireland 1988 to 50,000 a year, which was the figure given by Cardinal Rinuccini, who described the desperate plight of the Irish put on the slave ship. So, Big Jack was said, no matter what figure it takes, it was a horrendous number of people being forced to leave their native homes. There are different books and uh, on, on this whole uh, episode. This one I came across called White Cargo and this was written about the thousands of British people who lived and died in the bondage of America's colonies. Uh, they say in the 17th and 18th century 300,000 white people were shipped to America as slaves. Orchards were swept up from, from London streets to labour in the tobacco fields for life expectancy was no more than two years. Brothels were raided to provide breeders for Virginia. Hopeful migrants were duped into signing endangered documents, thinking that they would be free unaware that it would become the personal property of the person who bought, sold, or even gambled them away. Transport to the convicts were paroled for sale like livestock. And that is a group that is coming from, a uh, view coming from uh, British authors. Uh, Two other ones I picked up over the years, and one was uh, quite old. Uh, the other one was the untold history of the enslaved statement of whites in early years. Then one I picked up in um, 
Barbados, the Journal of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. I'm one other one. And I have the saying one time ago, you know, if you have a good book and a valuable book, there's always two idiots involved. One, the idiot who lent the book in the first place, and the other one that borrowed, he would be an idiot to give it back. So, you know, I was, I had one fabulous book called The Red Legs of Barbados, and by a Jim Shepherd, regarded one of the best books on it, and I got it in the museum over there, and someone begged me to, to like to read with it and hand it back, but I haven't seen the book since. But I would recommend that one particularly. And it tells the story of why the Irish got the name the Red Legs. You know, they said that they rolled up the legs of their pants and the, the legs were burned off with the, the heat and the, the sun there. But uh, I'll go a little bit more into that later. So we're so very much into slavery. Some uh, uh, in the most, uh, for the most unsavory reasons or uses. And others then ended up the life that if they weren't, um, I suppose, fit enough and capable enough in, in the plantation, the older and the weaker the groups ended up in the galleys. And galley slaves were probably bringing more captured slaves uh, across for their owners, but uh, the existence was very, very tough indeed. Sorry, can I just ask, uh, um, did most of the ships at the time have loads and loads of men like that? It did, it would, it laughed out quite as some would have been, particularly that would have been uh, not Africa, no, they would be using the boats like that, and there's probably some of that type came into Baltimore, because you can imagine they didn't rely solely on sail at all, <coughs> a bit too unpredictable, says it went for the work that they were doing. Yeah, you would have the galley slaves like that, yeah. But, um, <coughs> the merchant ships coming in and out of Cork in the day, the no, 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 they were mainly relying on, on, on sail. These were for very much for specific twofold purposes, I suppose. Polish, there could be convicts in there as well as captured slaves and the way of getting them to walk. But they were the early battleships as well, particularly around the uh, Middle East and uh, Egypt and the pharaohs that had these. Both the Greeks had them. I mentioned earlier about the um, uh, people saying that there was no white slaves. They were all indentured servants. Uh, try to explain what an indentured servant was. Some <coughs> sat down, agreed to do some work. Some did it, and I saw some examples of that. Did it for to do some work for and they walked their passage in other words. They were told if you you are free, we'll cover your passage over and you might do a year, two years walking and by plantation, but that some of them did that. But again, it turned out in a lot of cases, how long is a piece of string? Because you could be fine. Anything up, you might say, well, you broke your pipe or your spilled uh, tin uh, soup, so punishment to be paid for that, you could have a couple of months added on to your contract. Uh, and um, I tell you, uh, Liam Hogan, research librarian from Limerick, had done a lot of work on this and uh, Unlike slaves, servants were considered legally human. <laughs> if you were an indentured, you were legally human. 
uh, the servitude was based on the contract that limited their service to a finite period of time, usually about seven years. And the one difference that if they were and you were with a legitimate owner, you, it didn't pass, your contract didn't pass down to, to your family like the, uh, some did that your sons and your daughters were tied to the same owner as you were. It's true that the sense any form of coerced labour can be described as slavery from ancient Rome to modern day human trafficking. But in colonial America and the Caribbean, the word slavery has a specific legal meaning which, by definition, Europeans were not included. Slavery only applied in the legal term to those of the current uh, scheme. The One uh, American uh, professor, an indenture implies two people have entered into contract with, with each other, but slavery is not a contract. And this war of wars of between uh, whether a person was an indentured servant or whether it was slave uh, is still fairly strong particularly uh, in the States, and particularly around the New England area and the colleges of New England are known in Massachusetts and, and that they're very strong and that generation and that ethos has been passed on for quite a while. A few years, John Brennan, who said a few years he got into hot water for saying that, uh, from a transport of the um, to slaves to bar or slaves to Barbados. And he speaks about uh, how much trouble he got into and he didn't know he was opening up a, a culture war as he said, the kind of people who get together after that, carrying flame flaming fire brands and have made it one of their central beliefs that slavery was color blind. US slaves got over it, and so should the new African Americans. Right? Saying that uh, century or slave Barbados was equivalent to putting on a white hood and lighting a nice big torch. That you were in some sections of American public that was so outrageous your beliefs were. Uh, John Brent quotes in one of his articles about uh, University College London did um, a lot of research on legacy of British slaves and ownership on a, a website. Britain abolished slavery in 1830 and it did so by buying out every single slave owner. They paid a uh, mind boggling at that time, say 1834, a sum of 20 million to the small former slave owners. Uh, they record an awful lot of detail, every one of the 46,000 compensation payments uh, and all these records are available in National Archives and Q. What they also had done was they uh, mapped, and sometimes it would be nice to get this map, uh, where particularly from Ireland they have set up where the uh, names and addresses of the slaves that you could say there was 500 taken from Cork or Munster or whatever, that were done to that farm. And uh, it becomes clear where slavery derived wealth collected, who owned it, and how much they were compensated 
Uh, Ireland had very few slave owners at the time. <coughs> the, the links between the Barbados, Grenada and Jamaica with prominent individuals like his name is one there, William Gladstone, the Prime Minister, was the son of John Gladstone, recipient of the largest compensation payment. He won no fewer than 2,508 enslaved people in 1834. And as he said, it also makes it clear what the Caribbean people and the slaves got in compensation. Nothing. The slave owners were rewarded. All the slaves and contracts were all bought and for and the slaves, they got nothing. Uh, I went to Barbados on two occasions. The first was in 2011. I then was doing uh, research. I published a, a book on uh, maritime history of passage and the surrounding <coughs> area. And during the research, I came across a cook by the name of Paddy Murphy from Passage West. Catrice was uh, a relative for me, but uh, he died and was buried. He, he was overcome. He was on passage, would have been the main port of Ireland at that time for sugar importation. And uh, he was working one of the sugar ships, and being the cook, they used to store some of the per perishable, more perishable goods down in the very bottom of the ship, under water, to keep it a little bit cool. But he went down there, and I think that they were saying that the, the sugar fermented, and he was overcome by fumes. And he was buried in Barbados, so got out of Bridgestone. Now, I once said that it was part of the Caribbean cruise. That's a bit, a bit said then. But I was on the cruise, but I made a point to, uh, had booked in and had been in contact with the local uh, um, clergyman there and they showed me around the, the church but they had no records of them, the burial records but he, they pointed out some that they had around that period so we can assume it was correct that he died and was buried in Barbados. The strange thing about it uh, the church where he was buried was St. Mary's, the same as the church, or local church in the of St. Mary's. So that was my first uh, visit to Barbados. The next, uh, it was a former military prison, and they have a fabulous library and museum there. And I went there and my daughter and with me and we, she had done a bit of work and made contacts with the tourism office and uh, the local history uh, museum and then uh, so we had a program set up for us there but the amazing thing was that uh, the curator of the museum was a girl by the name of Pierce, colored girl, and she said to me she could trace back her family to Leinster. And I said, you missed the general celebration, you should be back with a name like Pierce and the celebration of the uh, Republic. <laughs> yeah. And the other girl was named King, who traced her relatives back to Cork. No, she wasn't quite sure they got so far, but that cop relatives and there's quite a few seamen from passage named Kings or shipwrights and seamen, so I don't know. There's two ladies very helpful. 
and toured museum. Uh, one of the, the saddest things that I saw there is that uh, they had excavated ground underneath uh, one of the big houses, plantation houses, and the burial ground. And the sad thing to see, they had the part of the ground there and photographs of the artifacts that picked up. But it was the array of clay pipes. You know, you could say it was the, the only probably worthy possession they brought with them from home was the clay pipes and they were buried. Although this was where all the slaves were buried, just the bottom of the hill from the plantation. And I say that a fabulous library <coughs> there as well. And, uh, a lot of, obviously, uh, uh, articles from shipwrecks around the, the area. And um, I noticed one thing there, there was, there was a little schoolyard attached to it. And the kids were out at lunchtime playing. And I thought they were playing as something we used to, as only stuff, and that was hoops. And just the steel hoops and stick, they were all up and down and around with the steel hoops. You don't see those anymore in, in around our schools. And as I said, we the museum we opened passage uh, uh, last July, and a local man who a uh, couple. <coughs> Their daughter is living in Cape Town. And this man is fascinated with books. The first place he go on ever is into a second-hand bookshop, looking around for books. And he came across this book, Our Settlers to Cape Town, The History of the Cat William 1820 Settler from Cork Harbor. And uh, it was a passing the captain uh, Parker, Parker, where I was born, were little row cottages and called Parker Place. And some of you may know it on passing the doctors by the large three story house called Lucia Place. And Lucia was named after Parker's daughter. He owned a, a, a lot of land and passage. He had a sugar plantation. He was shipping a lot of uh, sugar in and out to uh, passage and to the UK. And he also had a rope walk. But this man picked up that book and he, uh, he presented the book to the museum. And um, for the reading, and this will give you probably, to say, uh, a bit of the focus on the Harper left um, passage on a ship called the East Indian. He had a contract, uh, he was ordered a contract to bring settlers to South Africa, to Cape Town. And his party had the list of his party was gentry, uh, professions and tradesmen and of tradesmen and officers. He had seven on board. He had four. Uh, tri uh, sorry, he had gentry, professions, and officers. Seven tradesmen, four artisans and craftsmen, twenty-five farmers, seventeen laborers, ten. Others 13, which um, for the reviews found that they were family, uh, women and family. But all the um, tradesmen and farmers were guaranteed so much land, and they got the land and left off the tradesmen, some worked with the farm, some stacked it off and worked on their own. Now it wasn't all <coughs> bed of roses there either, but they set up the uh, Settlement in Cape Town, and some of the rooms of the buildings are still there. But it was nice to get to find the, that book. But uh, the main problems again there the land they had got 
eradicated. Some of it was uh, one really great, and uh, and they were moved on, but they moved on to some of the natives' lands, and there was a lot of killing, and there was almost a a, a civil war there at at that stage. But then. Uh, This is another uh, link to the whole Barbados and sugar trade. It's a headstone of uh, a man called Timothy Connell. He's buried in Passage West, the Old Church Cemetery in Passage West. He was one of seven crewmen murdered on board uh, a ship called the Mary Russell. Uh, I know that anyone of you hear about the book. Uh, was it Kathy Bunny wrote a book called The Ship of Seven Murders. The captain went mad on the ship coming back from Barbados. He thought that uh, the crew were plotting against them. Some said the crew were speaking Irish Gaelic and he was English and he thought that uh, they were plotting. But for men, uh, went off uh, last his mind. But if I show this is that the, so the poor, I think this emphasised the poor a captain had at sea at that time. Seven, he murdered seven of his crew, but he invited each one of them down into his cabin. Now, you think if the invited first fellow down and he never came back up on death, the second fellow might, might be so reluctant, uh, would have been reluctant to go, but they still went down all up to seven. One after the other, he allowed himself to be tied up and he knocked him with the, the sledgehammer. Now, they got sense after seven, through the crew, the signal, the ship, the British ship passing and tied up, came alongside and they tied up the captain. He tried to jump, jump over on two occasions and they couldn't name to cove. And uh, he was found guilty of murder but insane. And some of you may know around Black Rock, Black Rock area, the the um, Linville Asylum, did I remember Linville and Big House and down by Baton Temple, don't they? <coughs> and uh, he was committed there and the head uh, doctor at Linville at that time was a Dr. Osborne. And Dr. Osborne took a keen interest in Captain Stewart, who he said fluctuated by being perfectly sane one minute and insane the other. And he was, um, uh, when, Cap when Lynn, Captain Osborne, or Dr. Osborne was being transferred to Dublin, he took Captain Stewart with him. And when he was with him for many years, uh, Captain Stewart made a model of the Mary Russell ship over the chicken boards. But that, that headstone was worked on the icebergs on it that uh, the fellow um, was murdered on Mary Russell. Uh, she was trading in the sugar trade from Barbados. I have records for her in several years before this incident happened. But when you're in Barbados, you get the feel, looking at the records of the uh, plantations, looking at the um, the whole uh, manuscripts they had there, but also lo looking at the artifacts and everything they had there, what the lives of the slaves were really like. Now, the same extent is not recorded about the um, numbers in Virginia, with the plantation in Virginia, but uh, uh, 
in the emeritus book is certainly was questions questions whether yeah someone there trying to stop me you know yeah. <laughs> Uh, someone quest uh, questions or raised a question in my mind <coughs> was there much of a difference between slavery, white slaves, or uh, some put the term that, oh, they signed on to go. But many that signed on were one step away from slavery, some no step at all. So I I've given you a little bit of thought to a little bit further reading and make up your mind and to look at this debate. But whatever, is, it cannot be denied that thousands of people, be it the 12,000 estimated by one man to 50,000 estimated by the Cardinal, were forcibly removed from Ireland or to the Caribbean and to the Americas, certainly against their <coughs> will. How much a year? 50,000 a year. Sorry? 50,000 a year. 50, a year. 50, a year. Yeah. I'd like to thank Jim for the... Yeah. Yeah.